So I want to thank everyone for joining uh, BPOU uh, tonight for our legislative, uh, for our night of legislative advocacy. Uh, it's important for us to know that our voices can be heard. Uh, to also understand a little bit of historical pressure that sometimes marginalized groups such as that BPOU represents. Um, it may seem like it's a, uh, a steep barrier to overcome, but it's actually really just about knowing the route and how to advocate for your community uh, when it comes to our legislative session here in Utah. Uh, civic engagement uh, is something that uh, often sometimes will go to nonprofits and other special interest groups. So our interest is in health equity, addressing it within the state, and making sure that we can have improved healthcare outcomes for all. And we're gonna go over on how that can be approached from a legislative angle when it comes to certain policy and bills that may be affecting your household and your community. So helping me tonight will be Marion Martindale. Uh, she has spent over 20 years in communication policy. She's a communication policy professional. 20 years as corporate public relations. Uh, after leaving the corporate sector, she transitioned to the nonprofit public sector where she has pursued her passion for policy and advocacy. She uh, right now is at, including as executive director of the political advocacy organization Alliance for a Better Utah and senior policy advisor with the Salt Lake County Council. She's currently the CEO of the Utah Academy of Family Physicians, which I am a part of and has been a registered lobbyist for the state of Utah for nearly two decades, lobbying for good government, proactive and positive healthcare legislation, which is also in alignment with what is important to BPOU. So thank you for being here, Marianne, and I will get us started. So we're gonna do this a little bit in about three parts for people that are on the call. So we will have initial segment. I'm going to give a, a bit of a historical backdrop on why legislative action, empowerment, engagement, is important. Uh, and then uh, Marianne is going to give a little bit on the how to. And then hopefully, Representative Pollins or Senator Plum will be able to join us at sort of the midpoint uh, of, our, of our night. All right, sounds good. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. Uh, there will probably be a little survey that we will send out afterwards. This will also be available on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Remember to like and subscribe. Okay, so uh, moving on. Why is civic engagement, legislative advocacy so important? Oh, sorry, those were our special guests. So inequities can be fought with legislative policy and actions. But what I wanna just cover here tonight is how there are many aspects or laws that have impacted black and brown immigrants for decades in the US. And if we, and at certain, definitely at certain times in our past, we were more restricted in being able to vote, more restricted in being able to hold office. Now that it's 2024 and we are in a position to do more, apathy is not the solution. Saying I'm in the minority is not the solution, especially when there's a bill that can impact your future children and your current health. So just examples of how legislation went through, particularly in many states in the South, during Jim Crow with Jim Crow law mandated racial segregation in hospitals and healthcare facilities, leading to inadequate and unequal medical services for African Americans, leading to, of course, separate and unequal facilities that contributed to health disparities and outcomes that we have seen and set in generations thereafter. Housing discrimination and eugenics, so particularly housing discrimination, this affects one of those social determinants of health, particularly with our environment. Clean drinking water, clean air, leads to better healthcare outcomes. Well, discriminatory housing policies such as redlining led to segregation of communities based on race. And then one that often many people don't understand is the Medicaid exclusion for non-white uh, immigrants, particularly in the 1980s. Now, it may not be uh, very relevant or seen, but Utah is a state that receives quite a few refugees and immigrants. And Medicaid is very important uh, for them to be able to sustain their families and their lives as they learn workforce, about workforce training programs and more. Uh, however, it really right now is limited to those that are asylees and refugees uh, in regards to those that are immigrants. But there was actually written policy at the exclusion for non-white immigrants meaning it was a barrier if you were 
from a less aspired or esteemed nation that the federal uh, or federal government. So this is since has changed because it's controlled by states. So we even have uh, adjustments now, I think in at least 25 states, uh, maybe up to 30, uh, where prenatal care and children that are immigrant, no matter the status, no matter where they're from, is covered. But it's not a uh, blanket across the country, unless you're particularly refugee or asylum status. So there has been legislative policy and actions that have been ongoing. That's almost almost a, a, a ingrained part of our country's DNA that we should know so that we can make sure that anything else that may be written coming up, not necessarily in our state legislature, but even at the federal level, that we know how to advocate against. We know how to oppose. So I wanted to bring up one particular individual, and this is Friedrich, 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 it's called Friedrich, to use the German uh, pronunciation, Hoffman. So I don't know if many people are familiar with him, but he was a German statistician that came over in the early 20th century, where he, it, I guess uh, I'm trying to think of a simple way to put it. He wrote a book uh, on race traits and tendencies of the American Negro is what it was titled. And in his employment as a statistician by many organization, he did a lot of research in regards to ethnology. And he served as also president of the American Stati uh, Statistical Association. Well, he came over from Germany, mind you, this is in uh, the beginning of the, uh, right after the first right. And he was concerned and fearful that the US might become a welfare state. So in his book, he characterized African-Americans as an exceptionally disease prone, he even wrote about how if we did nothing to aid in the health of African-Americans in a few generations, they will no longer be a problem for our country. This was actually stated, uh, but he did not want his work used for nefarious means or restricting access to people. However, his work was taken to use to create legislation to restrict. And in many regards, or in many ways, it was used to not allow universal healthcare to often move forward in our nation. So we've had multiple attempts over the decades to try to have universal healthcare, but ideas and thoughts from my eugenics era, scientific racism that was perpetuated often by nobly minded statisticians from Germany led to many legislators in Washington in the early 20th century when a president or a leader wanted to have for a more progressive legislation to say, hey, you know, healthcare should be for all, it would often fail. And a lot of the motivations and influence came from this, in a way, racist suicides. Harry Truman proposed a comprehensive health insurance plan once again, that failed. When the Johnson signed into law the Social Security Amendments Act, that did pass, although there is a 20% amount that many are required to pay, it was placed there. And there are legislators that are on records placed there so that it can, once again, have an impaired or disproportionate access to those that were less fortunate and minorities in the country at the time, largely impacting African-Americans. And then, of course, we had Hillary Care in the 1990s. So I just want everyone to understand that this, those legislative policies, civil action procedures are an example of structural determinants of health. That's legislation, public policy, civil procedures that shape the health of individuals in a community we serve. We are going to discuss tonight bills that, that are infecting you as an, can impact you as an individual and the communities you represent and serve. So I just want, before we transition over to Marianne, I just want everyone to know your voice matters. And that's what I want, want everyone to take home for tonight. All right, Marianne, you can take over. My turn, take it away. Yes, please. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Um, I appreciate being asked to join. Um, I do these quite a bit, um, especially with, you know, in the, the healthcare or, or that realm of setting. Um, because it's it is really important, you know, to his to to the very last thing that Dr. Ferguson said, your voice matters. It really is critical that you participate. 
And it's super easy when you are a minority or, you know, you, you think, oh, they're just going to keep making these laws that are going to affect me. My voice doesn't matter. That is so not true. They do need to hear from you. They need to hear the personal stories. They need to know what's going on. So I'm going to just run through a few slides that are going to talk to you. Uh, I need to be able to share, Richard. Don't you just need to give me some permission to share? You should be able to. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, no, that's, that's fine. Just make sure I've got the right thing here. Loaded. You know, Zoom, it's always a million different little buttons you have to push. All right. So I'm going to just run through a few slides that are going to talk to us about how you actually advocate, like what it actually takes to get involved here in Utah. Um, as Dr. Ferguson and I were talking about this, we narrowed down um, really just 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 to the salient points of things that that are going to help you engage um but please feel free to ask questions along the way um i may not notice so if you want to unmute or if dr ferguson if you notice any hands or anybody speaking because i like to make this interactive because this needs you need to walk away from this knowing how to engage you need to walk away from it knowing knowing how to participate it doesn't mean any good to stand up here and go oh, rattle you off a big lecture and then you have not not have a takeaway so healthcare advocacy First of all, why why do we advocate? I mean, it really is as simple as that. If you're not if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. I mean, that has been said over and over and over, but it's never more true than with minority populations, women, uh, lower income, anyone who is not white upper class male. Let's just be honest. We 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 know how we know how our society is structured. Um, you're on the menu, and we're on the menu often. So there are a number of different ways to advocate. I mean, really, th this is one thing that I can't stress um, enough. Whatever is comfortable to you is the way you should advocate. It's not, you know, not everybody wants to wants to march up to the Capitol and lobby on behalf of things. It's a it's an awkward thing. It's not comfortable. It's weird. You don't know these people. Um, not everyone is comfortable on the phone. Some people prefer the phone. You know, it's just all, all of those, all the, anyway is fine. Whether you text a legislator, whether you write a letter to an editor, you know, it's in, in the newspaper, or you post something on, on your social media, or you actually go. Not doing it. Oh, hold on. Like, you, did you have a question? Oops. Oh, sorry. I didn't know I was unmuted. No, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. But really, it's you find your comfort zone because you're going to speak more from the heart. You're going to be much more comfortable communicating when you're doing something that you're all, a, a, in a way you're already comfortable. So we're going to talk a little bit about the legislative session. Right now, we're right in the thick of it. We are at the penultimate week. So we have one more week after this. It ends on March 1st. I'm going to walk you through just kind of just some quick, quick top, you know, top, top of line things here. So the legislature by the numbers. There's 45 days in the Utah State Legislature. It starts the day after Martin Luther King. An interesting thing to note um, before be Martin Luther King Day. Um, interesting to note a few years ago, it used to actually start on Martin Luther King Day, which was really odd. And, and they never did anything and never talked about it. Um, they passed a, a constitutional amendment that gave them the, the ability to adjust that. So it's now 45 days. It starts the Tuesday immediately fo following Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So this year it started on January 16th and it runs for 45 business days. The only day that they do not count is President's Day. So we got a holiday yesterday, which was very much appreciated. Um, there are 75 House of, Mem House of Representative members, 29 senators, and in order to pass a bill, you have to have a simple majority. So that means 38 in the House and 15 votes in the Senate. And then you have one governor. Now, the governor, it's kind of a little tricky. He can sign a bill. He cannot sign a bill. He can veto a bill. He has some flexibility. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's walk through how a bill actually becomes law, because there's a lot of steps that it goes through to do this. Oh, I have a cat that is meowing in the back. Just ignore it. My Alexa may talk to him. Uh, so first you have a bill that's introduced. And how do you think they get bills? They get bills because you talk to your legislator, because the neighbor talks to the legislator, because some guy behind is mad at his neighbor who does something with his property line. And so then he goes and he calls his legislator, who he happens to know. He might be in his neighborhood. He might be on the PTA, whatever, and says, 
we need a bill for this. We need to, we, you, we need to do something. If I knew a guy, so a bill is introduced, they write a bill. It goes to a committee hearing. Committee hearings are the only place throughout this entire process that I'm going to walk you through that the public actually speaks about a bill. This is where if you really are engaged, so this is where I spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time in committees and I speak on be, in favor of or opposed to bills. And it has to pass a committee. If it passes a committee, it then goes to the floor. So the floor, that means the entire body. So the House of Repre the full House of Representatives of the state of Utah, they have to vote on that and they have to vote on it. Like I said in the previous one, a simple majority. So it would mean 38 people would have to vote in favor of that. After that, it switches to the other house. So this is interesting. If a bill is introduced in the house, it has to also go through the Senate. And then they do the exact same thing. They have a committee hearing, they have floor action. And if nothing has changed, because it's a key a key point, is a bill is only enable, able to become a law if the language has been approved by both houses exactly the same. Then it goes back to the originating house, and they enroll it is what it's called, which means they send it to the governor. The governor can sign it. Sometimes he signs them right away. Sometimes he makes a big big to-do about it. I mean, it depends on what the bill is. Sometimes he vetoes it. Very seldom here in Utah, but he can. He has a veto. He has the, the ability to veto a bill, which means that the, the, the House or the Senate would have to reconvene if they wanted to override the veto. Or also in Utah, we don't actually require our governor to even sign a bill. So that means it just becomes law. So it's really important for you to know your representatives. This is the, this is, I, I honestly, if you, if you know your representatives, get to know them, not just during the legislative session, get to know them, meet with them, take, meet them for coffee to, or hot chocolate or whatever it is that they might drink, but, but make sure that they know who you are. And I think, uh, Marianne, if I wanted to just yeah. say, things uh and it's the bill introduction and relationship there is a reason why there are many bills that you'll just kind of have a question mark go over the top of your head and like who wanted this who thought of this is this something we need and that's where you have the family member that's when you have the neighbor that says my son goes to this school or my daughter is a pa and i want them to have more privileges because they complained about this the other night mind you that is often where it starts. And then it's and then it's put forward without often much research. So that's how you'll get some of these bills that seem just poorly written and like, where did this come from? They didn't go to any subject matter experts or sometimes realizing it's downstream impact. They often are influenced by one or two individuals will write it up based on often a template from another bill and put it forward to the committee. And sometimes the committees are often so busy, it'll keep going all the way through. So anyhow, sorry, Marianne. I no, no, that, that's, that, that's a really good point because you look at this picture. So this is actually a picture I took up from the gallery. This is the House of Representatives, I don't know, a year or two ago. Um, so these, all of these representatives, the, say this guy right here, he has a neighbor that wants a bill. These, the rest of these 74 people don't know anything about his neighbor. They don't know his neighbor. They don't know what's going to happen with it. A bill can be anywhere from 20 lines to 2,100 lines. I mean, it can be very comprehensive. I'll give you a couple of really quick examples. There's a legislator from Layton. This is several years ago. He had a neighbor who had this, this cat, a neighbor's cat that kept coming in his yard and using his yard as a, as a litter box. He was mad about it. He claimed it was a feral cat, which it wasn't. It was a neighbor's cat. But he complained so much to this legislator that was that, that was one of his neighbors and his friends that this legislator actually wrote a bill that was going to allow people to shoot feral cats if they came into your backyard. Literally, pull out a pistol, shoot the, the neighbor cat if it came into your yard. The bill didn't pass, obviously. I mean, the... the, the, the you can just imagine the consequences of that. I mean, it, it just, you know, firing guns in the backyard at a, at a cat just, just because it's using your, your, the bathroom. And there's no way to know if a cat is feral, if it's not feral, all those sort of things. But that's a perfect example of what Dr. Ferguson is talking about. It's that, that one guy had this bee in his bonnet over this cat, and we almost got a bill about shooting cats in people's backyards. It's ridiculous. We have another senator who is whose son is a PA. So what do we get? We get all kinds of, of um, physician assistant scope bills. 
he basically essentially wants his son to be able to to practice almost like, like a doctor would doesn't have nearly the amount of school nearly the amount of education the diagnostic skills the clinical experience all of that sort of thing but yet he because his son wants to he's been passing these scope bills that are passing year after year after year and it, the concern for us obviously is that it puts public health in danger if you have someone who's not trained doing things so we push back on those things but but it really it happens a lot and and i want you to be able to, to move on i don't want us to labor the point yeah. but once again that's an example of health equity they will often write a bill saying it's going to benefit all because now we have more providers that have a greater scope this will help more individuals but when it's not fully researched or you're accounting for their hour, uh, their, uh, their hours or restrictions that were with their prior associated with their license or just their level of education and experience, it actually can have downstream effects that can, will affect often first black and brown individuals in Utah. So anyhow, please lobby your representative. Absolutely. I mean, where do you think they're going to want to fill those PAs? They're going to want to fill them in their lower income areas because they're cheaper. So lobbying your legislators, so, uh, there's just a few key points to be. Always be polite. There is nothing more thin-skinned and sensitive than an elected official. They, um, you, you have to be polite, be professional. Practice what you're going to say. There's nothing wrong with that. I practice what I'm going to say, and I've been doing this for two decades. Make it short and sweet. You know, it's really easy. I mean, we all are so passionate about things. It's really easy to just go, you know, and just just essentially vomit out a white paper on, on why you think this bill is a bad idea. Keep it to three or four bullet points. Oh, we have Senator Hol or um, Representative Hollins. Do you want me to jump off? And uh, Just finish that last part. Okay. This, this and be confident. You know what you're talking about. You have the experience. It's your story. It's your, you're talking for a reason. So you, you have the right to talk to this person. This person isn't, there's nothing special about them other than the fact that they were elected. They might be a plumber. They might be a developer. I mean, we've got a legislature full of insurance people and builders. So, you know, there, there's no expertise that they have necessarily that you don't have. All right. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to stop that right there. So, uh, uh, Representative Hollins, I would like to give you the floor. So let me do a brief introduction. Uh, Representative Hollins has been in House Representative since 2015, correct? Yes. Uh, she is serving West Valley, and she is in District 21. Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, sorry. Northwest Salt side of Salt Lake, yes. Northwest, <laughs> Northwest of, 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 uh, Salt Lake, of Salt Lake City. Uh, we may also be joined by uh, Senator Plum, who is uh, over in District 9. Uh, but uh, we were just finishing up how a bill goes through, what's our kind of the numbers going through committee, how a bill is often introduced, and how to communicate to a legislator. So Representative Hollins, with uh, the people that are our supporters and followers here on BPLU, we would love it if you could share on what are the best ways that you are receptive when receiving advocacy, but also any bills of interest that we should focus on. Yes. Hi. Good evening. I apologize for being a little late. We were in actually in health and services and uh, Jen, um, Senator Plum probably is going to be a little behind. She was just in that committee um, um, running a bill, defending a bill that is going to ban um, flav some flavor um, vaping um, to try and keep it out of our children's hands. And so she's probably going to be a little late. Um, so the best way to advocate for me, and I could tell you this is um, probably other um, legislators, I can say this also. Um, first of all, I saw the, uh, saw the um, post when I first got on about being polite. And I think for me, that's one of the main things. Um, it's just to be polite. A lot of times I receive these nasty emails, um, very nasty, and they immediately turn me off. Uh, for me, um, I think that we can agree to disagree without being nasty um, on a lot of different issues. So I think when you when you um, approach your legislator, be polite with them. Let them know what your concerns are. Let them know that you are a constituent. Let them know what your concerns are with a bill and let them know why um, you have that concern with a bill. Um, usually email or texting or just calling, requesting a meeting. If, um, all works for me. Um, I always tell my constituents when you come up to the Capitol um, and ask for me, please be sure to let 
the green coat know when you come to the door or let my intern know when you come to the door and ask to speak to me that you are a constituent. Because for me, um, giving my constituents first priority over everyone else is, is that's part of what I do. Um, that's, that's part of, um, I believe that that's only right and that's only um, fair. And so that's what I would suggest you do. Um, you are the expert, as was said earlier. Um, a lot of times we as legislators, we don't know everything. We don't see everything that happens. And sometimes you can catch a part of a bill or, or you can talk about your personal experience and the impact that this is going to have on a bill. And it could change the outcome. It could change a vote. And so go in with that mindset that you're going to tell your story. You're going to tell the impact that this is going to have on you um, or the impact that it's going to have on the, the community. So that, those would be my, my suggestions. And also, you know, with your legislator, a lot of, all of, most of the time, we get these ideas for bills from you. So if you have any ideas about some legislation that, be, that should be run, contact your legislator and let them know that this is what is occurring. I think this is an issue we have in our community and I believe that this can be a solution and talk to them about it, but talk to them about it early enough, like um, in the summertime um, when bills are first getting drafted, then you have a better opportunity of, of having that bill drafted and having that conversation. So I think most of the bills that were concerned are the ones that you had on, on your list. And I think we're Dr. Ferguson are pretty much in sync in bills that we are concerned about. Anything that has to do with limiting Medicaid and limiting anyone's access to health care is always a, a big concern of mine. The tobacco use bill um, that we just got through from debating um, is a, um, was a concern of mine because of the impact that it has on our kids. Um, um, I have a daughter that's a school teacher, and she just always telling me the, the concerns she has about um, kids vaping in the bathroom and in the schools um, where she teach. So, so those are some of my concerns and those are some of the best ways that I feel that we can, we can advocate. Representative Hollins, uh, sometimes I'm uh, sent an email, as I'm sure many people here, where it will be a template to email. How do you have your email stand out when someone's trying to give you what to say because you're kind of maybe uh, pressed for time and how do you make sure that your email or what you should put in the, the subject heading so that you know that you want your representative to say, I'm from here, because mm -hmm. often has to email as many representatives as possible to say oppose, but how do I make sure that my representative, my senator knows to look out for my email or text message? I always tell my constituents to put in the subject line, constituent. I literally receive thousands and thousands and thousands of emails, especially when I'm here in session. I receive so many emails and I try to go through and, or have my intern go through during session and pick out constituent emails and put them to the side so I can go through and read them. But there are so many, sometimes we may miss them. And a lot of times I get emails and, um, you know, although I don't mind getting emails from people who are not my constituent, but someone in St. George emailing me is not as important as, say, my constituent emailing me, giving me their opinion. I'm going to still read it if I have time, but my constituent emails are going to be the first emails I, I read. And I, I and so I would suggest in that subject line put constituent. And so it, it stands out and they know that, okay, this is one of my, this is a person in my district. And I appreciate you reading my email, even though I'm not a constituent. <laughs> I always read your emails. <laughs> Any questions for Representative Hollins while we uh, still have her, those of you on the call? I do. Uh, um, hey, Representative Hollins. <laughs> um, oh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so I can hear you. yourself, Chris. Oh, no. Oh, can y'all hear me? Sorry, I was yes, glitching. Let me see that. Okay. Um, I think what um, Dr. Ferguson was saying, I think the big hang up is structuring template, um, short and sweet. I'm getting that. Um, mm -hmm. I like the um, addition of, say, constituent in the subject line. Um, but I guess as things get going, you kind of, at least I'll speak for myself, I get nervous and anxious. And 
wanting to make sure language is okay. Um, and I do like structure. I like a yellow brick road. I can follow every time. So mm -hmm. when it comes to the body of the email or any kind of reach out, mm -hmm. do you have some tips as far as quote unquote, the yellow brick road we can follow all the time that's kind of fail proof? Yes, for me, it's structure in the email. As was said earlier, don't make it long because I've literally gotten emails that's been pages and pages and pages. And it's like, I, I can't read all of this. You know, this is a lot. So keep it short. Let me know. Introduce yourself. Let me know who you are. I'm your constituent. Um, this is my address. In the bottom part of the email, when you sign your name, be sure to put your address in there. Um, this is who I am. These are my concerns. And these are why I have concerns. These are the bullet points of why I have concerns. Or these are the questions that I have on this bill. Because sometimes I get very good questions from constituents that maybe I didn't even think about. And I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about it from that perspective. Let me ask this question so I can find the answer out. And so just keep it short, give us the bullet points on why you like the bill or why you don't like the bill and, and kind of a brief paragraph of who you are. Gotcha, thank yeah. you. What about adding a story? Should a story to personalize it or that makes it too long? If it makes sense, if it makes sense. So um, sometimes I have someone email me um, and say, you know, um, if this bill passed, let me tell you about the impact. Let me tell you about my child and the impact that it's going to have on them if this bill don't, don't pass or don't pass. And so sometimes those stories make uh, make a difference, but try to keep them in one page. Don't try not to let them go three, four, five pages. Just kind of keep it that one page um, if, you, um, if you're gonna tell your story. Anyone else have questions? I see Dr. Chen here, Mr. Baxter. Anybody? I have a second one, but I don't want to be greedy. Oh, so no, go for it. Go on. We <laughs> um, okay. Well, since you're here, um, I'm also a community outreach coordinator and therapist, and we've actually yeah. bumped into each other before. Yes. Um, and the biggest thing I've learned kind of as a grassroots person who advocates more on the meso micro, um, like in schools or in um, outpatient is it feels like it would be nice to have some kind of rapport with a representative such as yourself or your legislators, um, just because you're seeing a lot of things, or maybe there's something that we're um, butting up against with the legislation that is deeply impacting our population. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice as to, I guess, the second half of my role as a social worker is to actually advocate and be out there legislatively. So building rapport with representatives and legislatures and kind of being prominent so I can um, kind of be a bridge between my population and what's being done on Capitol Hill. Absolutely. Um, I have some constituents that I know personally who will email me about different things that's going on and I know who they are. And I, you know, and and they would text me and they would email me. I have even have constituents who listen in on the debates and they would text me and say, I don't do no rep. Or can you ask this question? And so I think having that rapport with them um, makes a makes a really big difference. Um, especially if you're talking about working in the um in the in, in, around mental health and maybe coming to some like of the social services appropriation or health and human services committee meetings. Um, and when they ask for public opinion, you know, uh, we get to know a lot of people like Mary Ann, <laughs> who comes to a lot of those meetings and, and speak up, you know, even though she's she because she's representing organizations and, and, you know, physicians, but a lot of times we get to know constituents who come and show, just show up and talk about, you know, and get to know the representatives. So yes, having that rapport, I think, makes a, a Thank you so much. Yes. That's that whole, try to have a little cocoa, try to have a little coffee in the non-legislative session with your representative. Absolutely. I have had um, constituents reach out to me and say, hey, can we go to coffee? 
just to talk. And I'll go, yeah, let's let's meet. And I'll meet at a local coffee shop in the, in my district, and we'll sit there and we'll we'll just talk about what their concerns are. So I think that would be totally appropriate to be able to do that. And this is important, y'all, because there are bills that are not in the BIPOC community favor where it's being decided and brought up over these small uh, interaction relationships that they have built with their senator and representative. So mm -hmm. we should not sleep on that as a community. Yes. I appreciate that because I had no idea you could do that. So just that open information is very impactful. So thank you. Absolutely. I've had constituents stop me in the grocery store because they want to hold conversations. <laughs> they will stop me at the grocery store or stop me anywhere they see me because sometimes I go out of my district to shop and they've seen me and go, oh, Rep Collins. <laughs> One of your constituents. <laughs> I know you're about to sit down and have your burger, but can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, get to know them. Get to know who your representative and your senator your senator is. And the same applies if you visit DC. You have a right to go right in there, write down, I would like to meet with so-and-so, Burgess, whoever it is in Utah. I want to meet with Romney. You can you can do that. Might not be able to have coffee with them outside, but mm -hmm. you'll be able to see them when you're when you're there. So emailing, giving a call, uh, because it can happen. Yes. Good, yeah. good points. Mm -hmm. hmm. Anyone else with questions before we uh, move a little bit on to our presentation before we kind of, um, uh, so, because I think our next section, Marianne, is you're going to go into bills to focus on. Yeah, we're going to talk about a couple couple specific, just, just to give some examples. I mean, we could talk all night about bills. Good Lord. Representative Holland, <laughs> which, uh, if people wanted to contact you that are maybe a constituent here in this call, should we, uh, should your, just use your email that uh, the one that's listed, uh, the legislative Utah.gov? You know? Yes, that email, or you can text me on my legislative phone, 385-232-1915. You can call or text me on that phone. Text is usually better. You, and what is that again? Eight oh one. Legislative phone number is 385-232-1915. Right. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Yes. Okay. You all, all right. take care. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Keep doing that hard fight for us. Thank you. Bye. All right, and Marianne, if you wanna, you should still be able to share here. Yeah, so she she's great. And she hit on some really good points. And I like that she reiterated some of the stuff that we were talking about, but I mean, it really is important to get to know them. I mean, I think that's one of the most important things of it because when you make a personal connection with someone, they have a reason to listen to you. You know, if you just, if the only time they ever see you or hear heard of you is when you sent them an angry text or you called them or you went to a committee and you told them that, you know, this bill was really bad because of this, they don't have a personal connection. They don't understand it. But um, Chris, I, I thought, you know, your approach was really great. I mean, sometimes it is whatever, like I said, whatever works for you. If it's easier for you to write down in some sort of a format, do that. Just keep it short and sweet. That's all you have to do. And you can, you can write it. I mean, I'll tell sometimes people, you know, they're like, I don't know how to edit. I'm like, well, then write your stream of consciousness and then write it as though you got to do it in a text. You know, you go back and you edit it and you're like, okay. That I can say that in one sentence instead of 14. I can say this, personal stories are great, but again, we don't need to know about your grand, great, 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 great grandparents and this and that and all, you know, every person that's ever interacting in your life. Where does it gonna, what's the impact of the bill? One thing she didn't mention is always make sure that you talk, you say the name of the bill, not just the number, because they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. There's probably eight or 900 bills a year that they have to go through. So if you say, I hate HB 405, you need to say what the, what the title of the bill is. So just make sure you include that. All right, I'm going to share the rest of this and we'll go and jump into a couple things. Oops, wrong one, wrong button. There we go. Um, so online resources are really great. Are, are you seeing my computer screen? Okay. So we have, we have actually have strangely enough, an award-winning website. They do actually give awards to legislative websites that are really good and easy to follow. I love our website. I have seen other states and they're horrible. 
but our website, you can find anything very clearly. So right there, the very homepage tells you what's going on. So for today, see, she was in this health and human services committee. So I could have clicked on this right arrow and joined and watched that committee live. So you don't have to be up there. You can watch live if you just want to see what's going on. They're all recorded, so you can go back and you can listen to them again. But this is all also where you can look up bills. So let's just say, uh, well, let's see, what's let's do 463. That's that's a hot button bill right now. So here's a bill, Medicaid funding amendments. And I'm I'm going to talk about bills again in a minute. But while I was here, I thought this would be be good to show you how to do it. Be there sure. is a way to use the website as a tracker. So when you know that you have some bills or you've heard, maybe Dr. Fergus has, has sent out a thing and said, hey, be aware of this bill. If you guys can talk to your legislators, this is really important. There's a way for you to actually track it. So you can do, I, sorry, sharing, I've got- Are you sharing? What? Because you're still on the you, online resource slide. Are you sharing a web page? Yes, I am. Okay, you're on the long screen. All right, let me get back, to stop to that and start it again. This is what Zoom, I wish I could toggle in Zoom. All right, so this is the website right there. This is this is the homepage of the Utah State Legislator website. So this is where you see what committees are going on. See, there's still two committees that are going. They, they might go until 7.30 tonight. I mean, it depends on if they've got a lot because we're in the second to the last week. So there's a lot of things going on. Um, you can look at any particular day. So if I wanted to see what was on tomorrow, I could click on here. I could go down to, well, let's say business and labor. I can click on that. I could look at the agenda. This is the agenda. I'm not going to click on it because it's actually going to just download it. But if you want to join a committee, this button, see that right arrow that joins you into a committee if it's green. So we could have actually jumped into one of these committees right here if we wanted to. But the bills, this is an important part. So let's say Dr. Ferguson says, hey, you all, HB 463 is really bad. Please talk to your legislators, follow what's going on. This is important. And it is a really bad bill, actually. It has the potential to essentially kill Medicaid expansion as well as a bunch of other really good Medicaid, um, me Medicaid programs. So they have a really great service. It's called a tracking service. So I'm already logged in, as you can see. You would have normally, if I clicked this and I was not logged in, you would have to set up a login. But I can click on that bill and I can say tracking, I can go to my tracking page and I can track a bill. It's gonna add that to my list of bills and I deleted mine for, for this example. But it's showing this bill here. It's going to email me everything that happens with that bill. So if I'm really, I mean, this is like this is like you're really invested in this bill and you want to go up to a committee or you want to know exactly what's happening with it, it will email you every time, you know, that 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 tracking thing that I did that showed you the progress of a bill, it will email you every time it moves to a new step, every time it goes to a committee, every time it's on the floor, every time it's heard on the floor and passed, every time it goes to the next committee and so forth. So this is a really great way. You don't have to rely on your um, setting up some fancy spreadsheet or anything. This is a really great way, especially if you're looking at two or three, three or four bills. I mean, this is a really good way to track and follow the bills along and it'll tell you what's happening with them. See, this is telling me HB 463. It had a second substitute, which just means that the somewhere along the, the way, the, the sponsor substituted it with some different language. And it's now at the House third reading calendar, which means it's getting ready to pass the House. Once it passes the House, then, of course, like we said, it'll have to go through the Senate. This bill has a lot of problems. We're trying to kill it before it finishes the House. That's our goal. So let's go back to this and then jump on a little bit of. There we go. You seeing this one right now? The blue blue again? Yes. So this is the website. Le.utah. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Le.utah.gov. That gets you to the legislative website, and you can't break it. Go on there, mess around with it, get, create a login with your regular email, try different things. You can look at code. You can, I mean, you can get as deep as you want into it. But you can also find your find legislators on there. You can find all their contact information. They all have a page with their picture that'll have list the list of bills that they're working on and it'll have their email address, it'll have their contact phone number and so forth. 
You can't, you can't mess it up. So don't be afraid to mess with it. So let's talk a little bit about some issues. It's important to focus your issues because it, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. Um, policy is an overwhelming thing. Politics is overwhelming. I mean, we all know that it's just, it's just a constant stream. So it's important to focus on things. So Black Physicians of Utah, as does um, Utah Academy of Family Physicians, we try to focus on just specific areas. So healthcare accessibility. These are things like, can you get, do you have, how's your insurance? Are, are there, is there enough doctors in your area? Is there coverage for that? Is, do, do we have Medicaid coverage that covers well care visits for adults on Medicaid? So forth. Healthcare workforce development, a really, really critical one, because we know, especially in our ethnic populations, we are so underserved. We are so desperate to have physicians, PAs, NPs, nurses all across the board, the whole team. So that's a really critical ask thing to follow. And then just positive public health. There's just some really good and some really bad bills that get proposed every year. Representative Hollins was mentioning Senator Plum's tobacco bills. So she has a couple really good bills that are to um, further restrict the ability of, of our youth to access tobacco. You know, something that we know, if you start smoking young and you don't quit, you're likely to, to carry it on through life. And we know there's just so many health problems associated with that. So let's talk about a few bills. So uh, these are just, I this is just a sampling. As I said, there's, there's eight or 900 bills to go through. Um, but I wanted to show, talk to you about there's good bills and there's bad bills. So, you know, we always are talking about negative bills, like, oh, you got to tell them to oppose this, oppose this, oppose this. It's important to remember, there's also some really good bills that pass. So 565, I'm not going to remember what it is. Dr. Ferguson, do you remember what 565 was? Oh, uh, isn't that the one uh, about, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, hold on. Okay, that's medical eligibility. So this yes. is a bill from a Utah County legislator. Her name is Marsha Judkin. She's a representative. So it's HB because it started in the House. If it was started in the Senate, it would be set SB. And it is to provide a, a easier pathway for people to check their progress as they apply for or try to change things in Medicaid. So right now, it's very difficult. I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with Medicaid, but it is a behemoth. It is complex. The application process is really complicated. This is a way to streamline that. So people that need it are going to be able to find out information quicker. They can get text messages that tell them, we need one more piece of, of documentation, or you've been approved and you can now get care, or you can do this. They don't have to wait for all that. It used to be that you had to wait for paper mail, which is you know ridiculous in this day and age. Another one that I wanted to highlight was, is 275. And that one is... I think that's the Great Salt Lake Queen. Yeah, so this is an interesting one because this isn't isn't it's it's healthcare adjacent, but it certainly affects our healthcare. So it, you know, we all have heard about what's going on with the Great Salt Lake. It's bad. You know, we know that it's drying up. There is toxic fumes, toxic dust um, that blows off of the lake, and who who knows what what problems that's gonna that we're gonna see down the road with children and so forth with that. So we have a legislator that proposed to restore to, to create greater restrictions on the extractive industry. So extractive industries are the ones that, that you see the big boats out in the middle of the lake that are extracting the salt, they're extracting different minerals, there's lithium in there, all sorts of things. Well, if this passes, it will change a very strange law. Up until this bill, all of us, if I was a farmer and I was, I was farming out in that area, I had restrictions. If the lake got to a certain le level, I was restricted on the amount of water I could use if I was relying on the on you know runoff that was going to go to to Utah Lake, to the Great Salt Lake. The extractive industry had no restrictions, so they could essentially drain that lake dry. It's an absolutely ridiculous thing. It's an antiquated law. So fortunately, someone looked that up and they figured it out. Um, and if that it's going to pass, it looks like it's going to pass, but it's going to restrict mineral industries from from draining the Great Salt Lake down to nothing. So it's a step. You know, it's one of those things that a lot of things that need to happen with the Great Salt Lake, but it's a step in the right direction. It's at least making sure that they're following the same rules that the rest of us are having to follow. But then there's also bad bills. Here's just a couple. 405 is a bill that was going, that is re removing any sort of medical exemption for masks or vaccines in higher education. That's a real problem. You know, for a doctor, 
a, a med student, a resident that is going into doing their rotations in the hospital and is doing going in a, a cancer ward, going in a, a communicable disease ward, any of those things, in NICU, um, they can say, I have a personal objection. It doesn't even have to be a medical or a religious exemption. They can say, I have a personal exemption. I do not believe masks work, so I'm not going to wear a mask. And they have to provide a, 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 an option for that, which is just, it, in my mind, it's absurd. I mean, and it's just, I mean, that's a huge public health impact. Like okay. masks, like masks, it's still a really critical thing. And physicians wear these all day, I mean, hours on end. And you're asking someone to wear it for a little bit of time. It just, anyway. But we can see here, yeah. was that bill likely written by someone that's a physician that advocated to say, oh, a med student who's in training who could clearly be ill carrying pathogens is not required to wear a mask if they don't want to for whatever reason and it's like how who's even spending time what med student what parent of a med student was concerned enough to spend time writing something like that so right. this is where we see examples of that came from someone someone's relationship with someone that was in uh medical training so yeah, it's, it, it actually came through a nurse in training and they make because the way they write code, they cover everybody with it. And yeah. their argument was, well, other students don't have to do it. Well, I'll tell you, I was an English major. I never went into a cancer ward. I well, that was not required for my degree. So it is not equal. There is no equality when we're talking about a med student versus a, a humanities student. It's just it's it's absurd. Um, and then HB 463, of course, is one that we talked about. It's Medicaid. Um, we're we're whittling away at that one everywhere we can. I've been meeting with legislators for the past two weeks on that. And I actually am cautiously optimistic we're going to defeat it. So good things can happen and good things can happen to bad bills like that. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna not we're not gonna let that one pass. There's always I mean there's always other bills, but that's just that's just a sample. But really, here's I, these are the things I want to leave you with. Be curious. Think about the things around you. This is, you know, to, to Representative Holland's comments and what we've talked about. Be curious. If there's something that you're like, wow, I wonder why there's not a law about that. Or maybe there shouldn't be. Or maybe this regulation should be removed because this has no bearing whatsoever in modern technology or whatever the situation. Ask questions. You don't, we don't know what we don't know. They don't know what they don't know. Tell your stories. Personal stories sell up there. They sell. I have I, I can talk until I'm blue in the face about science, and someone can come up and give a sob story about their daughter who's dying of something, and that is going to move the legislator much faster and much farther than I can. I'm going to give them I'm going to give them the the argument that they need if they need the legal argument or the 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 healthcare you know administrative argument, but that personal story is really what moves it. And then finally, your voice matters. It matters. Your voice is critical to be heard up there. It's not heard enough. Senate Representative Hollins is our only black legislator. That's not representative of the community. We have a, a very small number of um, Asian Pacific legislators. We have, um, we don't have anyone who is LGBT. Oh, we have one person who is LGBTQ. I mean, it's minorities are not represented on the Hill but yet fast becoming the majority. I mean, let's be honest, if we really look at numbers, we're, we're gonna be seeing a significant shift in our population. Your voice matters, never give up, do not give up. We will make changes, it feels frustrating, it's hard, it's it's hard to lose your, you know, it, I, I, I sometimes I, I see people's soul get crushed with legislative stuff that goes on, but just don't give up because it really, it really is gonna be better. And that's, that's, that's all I have. Questions? Questions, anyone? Yes. Um, thank you so much for what you presented today. It's been really helpful. I actually thought the opposite. I thought numbers and quantitative um, rhetoric was going to be the thing to sell legislators in the meetings. And I'm thinking storytelling, they're probably like, womp, womp, I don't want to hear it. But it's kind of refreshing to hear that our story and our passions are that are leading us to advocate for something is a thing that sells um, when you're on the floor like that. Um, in addition, I was wondering if 
we run into hurdles or we just need someone to bounce things off of, are we able to reach out to you? Absolutely. I welcome it. Okay. Awesome. Text me, email me. I am, I am connected all the time. So I am, I am happy to help you with anything. If you have questions about what a bill even means, because bill language is funky. Mm -hmm. It is legal ease. It is not something that it doesn't just say this bill will do this and it will touch this many people and it'll cost this much money. It talks about code and back and forth and it's going to do this and it's going to do that. It's very complicated. So if you're looking at a bill and you think this doesn't seem right, text me and say, hey, is, does this bill do what I think it's going to do? And think about this in a 365 because it's easy to think about a 45 day window because it is crazy, wow. it's a crazy 45 day window. But think about this in a 365. Get to know your legislators out of the session. Don't, you know, they're, they're so busy during the session and, um, you know, pay attention during that. That's when you want to bring ideas to them. That's when you want to talk to them about what they're planning on working on. But it is important to hear the perspective because it's those unintended consequences that get us in the end all the time. Oh, good question. good questions. So if anyone has an opportunity, uh, either the link in the chat, uh, this will be sent out. Mind you, this will be recorded up to uploaded to our YouTube channel in about several days. Uh, but if you could scan our QR code either in the chat or, or excuse me, the link in the chat or scan here, we would love just three or four or five questions. We want to do more webinars before the community appreciates it. Uh, we can answer many questions. Uh, we're almost doing them monthly at this point. And I also want to make people know that uh, BPOU has more events coming up. So if people want a free electronic toothbrush tomorrow that are part of a big giveaway and you want to know the importance of dental access and dental health for your overall health, join us tomorrow evening at South Main Clinic. And then also I will be speaking uh, to kick off colorectal cancer awareness. Uh, of course, it has a disproportionate impact on black men. Uh, and I will be addressing not only the screening, but also the benefits of genetic testing. And then we have some more fitness stuff for Heart Health Month. So uh, one of our pre-med mentees, Taylor Hughes, she will be doing a spin class benefit for BPOU. And we will have our very own Dr. Jones who did our Heart Health Talk uh, just past this past Tuesday or a week ago. She will be leading a Zumba class. And then we have CPR training on March 2nd. All of this will be on our webpage uh, and on our on our home slider, and also we'll go out in our newsletter tonight. 